who's uh, joining us from the uh, physics and astronomy department at UCLA, right up the road. Uh, so my aunt received his PhD in physics and the title of his thesis in quantum field theory was uh, path integral derivation of super conformal and super current anomalies and super symmetric theories. A lot of supers there, three supers, super duper. <laughs> So that's an auspicious beginning for his uh, career. But after that, he, you know, three supers were followed by three postdocs. You know, it, it, you know, I've heard of people doing two, but uh, he was uh, clearly uh, very much uh, inspired the first uh, with Haim Sampolinsky and Haggai Bergman uh, at Hebrew University. Uh, and this was a uh, concerned uh, beta uh, oscillations in the motor cortex. Uh, the second one was with Bruce McNaughton and Carol Barnes at the University of Arizona. And, and I, this is where I first met Mayak. And he was doing a fascinating experiment. Uh, and it had been reported that the place fields could change position according to the rat running through the maze. Uh, man, I don't know if you remember that. Okay, he, he yeah, It was at the next meeting that I first presented this. Really? Okay, well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's an uh, interesting uh, sidelight. And then, but that wasn't enough. Uh, so Bruce was, was a great mentor, but he decided to go work with Matt Wilson at MIT, who was previously mentored by Bruce McNaughton. Uh, and uh, from there, he went to Brown as an assistant professor. And from there, he went to UCLA. So he's, he's uh, been very uh, uh, itinerant. But uh, and he's been at UCLA since uh, it looks like 2012, in, including the departments of neurology and neurobiology. 2010, but yeah, same thing. Okay, uh, 2010. Okay, so that's uh, 20 years, uh, 22 years. So you've been there for quite a while. Uh, so Mayank, as you'll see, uh, has used a lot of different technology to study uh, the hippocampus. And, and also uh, dendrites of neurons in the hippocampus. And last year, he had a double header, two articles in Nature. And I think some of the work he'll be telling you about today is based on that research. So, Mac, it's uh, all, uh, take it away. All right, thank you. Thank you, Terry and Frederick, for inviting me. Before I jump in, uh, can everybody see my screen well? Is anything getting obstructed? Do, are you seeing the video as well or just one screen? That's clear. That's really awesome. Clear. So great, let's get started. So as Terry mentioned, I was doing, you know, uh, theoretical physics. Uh, such people should never be allowed near experiments, but I was. And this is a recent ex my excitement. Just a few weeks ago, people found that in the standard model, which is, as we know, is not sufficient due to infinities and so on, which was my PhD thesis work, they found that W boson is 0.1% greater than expected by theory. And that led to a lot of excitement. People think, oh my God, there is a chance that the theory is wrong and there is new science, such as supersymmetry. And contrast that with neuroscience, where you know models are most of the time optional, and model and theory experiment and match 10%. Uh, Nobody is really looking for that qualitative match is all that happens. And people say this is not possible. So theory and experiment match is not possible with notable examples, but that's the common perception. And they say, because physics is simple. Well, that's just one equation number 53 for my PhD work. It's not simple. So if we can't do it, it's our weakness. And in case this case, my weakness. So I took on this challenge to say, uh, how does the brain perceive and create abstract ideas? How does it do that? Uh, of course, in order to do that, we have to look inside the brain and we can't really look inside the human brain with electrodes and single neuron resolutions. So the question becomes, are there universal abstract ideas valid across all species? So whatever my perception of the abstraction is, that's what is likely that the mouse is also creating that perception. So I can interrogate with my mental framework, which is my bias of designing the experiment. And long story short, if you are a physicist, uh, just like if you are a hammer, everything's a nail, space and time is everything, right? 
And this bird is flying from Arctic to the pole to pole every year. On the way, it dives in and picks up a fish. The bird and fish live in totally different, uh, different species, different environment, different experiences. But every creature on the planet must agree with each other, other creature on the exact definition of space, time, distance, angle, pretty complicated thing, which are both are changing. And that perception of space, time, distance, and angle was off by even a small amount then either the bird will never catch a fish or bird will catch all the fish and birds are dead because they became too fat. So okay, space and time- Mayak, time Mayak, it's, it's a good thing that the, 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 this bird doesn't have to worry about general relativity, right? I know, that's right. On this scale, they don't even have to worry about it. So how, how is it that while our eyes see a two dimensional world where things are moving, maybe some sounds as well, from that, we are creating that compelling feeling that there is a certain distance in ahead of us. There is certain direction. How do we create that? So people have done a lot of work on it. That's the brain. There are a huge number of neurons and even more number of connections. That's the visual part of the brain circuit, right? At the bottom is the eye. And then there are lots of interesting brain regions. Terry has probably written at least two papers on each one of them. So he's the world expert on these areas. And at the other end is this little area called HC or hippocampus. Uh, so in the sense of deep networks, many people have made the analogy that that's the farthest removed from the input layer. These are so-called hidden layer and that's what does abstraction. And there is some evidence for that. There's also bad evidence. People who have Alzheimer's, they stay hearing, smells and so on are mostly okay. Same thing with autism, epilepsy and so on, but they somehow can't remember things such as episode, which is kind of abstraction. Uh, people have looked inside the brain and found there is a representation of abstract space, which got the Nobel Prize in 2014. If you look further, there are brain rhythms, uh, which seem to be playing an important role. All of this happens not just during behavior, but also during sleep. And as a result of all this representation and plasticity and so on, eventually there is memory. So how can we make a theory out of it? Because this seems too much. So we are going to simplify this. We are going to just like be a physicist and say, let's start with one dimensional space. So we know that in synapses in the brain, since Hebb's theory of 1949, there are 47,000 papers that show there is NMDA dependent plasticity. It happens and it has the same structure as Hebb proposed. So NMDA or Hebbian plasticity, well established. This phenomenon of place cell that I'll be spending a lot of time, 64,000 citations. So well-established phenomenon that when a rat walks around, there are place cells. And then does the place representation play a role in memory Well, you dunk the rat in a cold tank of water and he has to escape to find a hidden platform that he can't see? That's called the water maze task, 20,000 publications over the last 40 years. So these are very solid findings. And each one has a tremendous amount of background, but how the three work together, that's a challenge. So as Terry mentioned, this is the first time I met with Terry. I got into hippocampus at that point. And I asked, well, are place cells, is there any hint that place cells are changing? So here is the x-axis where the rat is running. He starts from 150 to 200. He's running before and after two. But this neuron is active only in this region. The y-axis is a trial number. He just runs back and forth, straight line. That's it, nothing else. No task, just gets rewarded too. And each circle is a spike from one neuron. And what you can see in the red line is the center of mass of the place field. These are the spikes. This is roughly the place field here. And what I noticed is that these place fields are actually increasing activity and they're going backwards. The rats going from left to right, the place fields are going backward, creating so-called predictive representation or these days called successor representation. Not only that, we notice that some place cells actually are silent in the first roughly five trials, maybe more, and then they boom, turn on almost abruptly. And they too do this predictive shift. So we got excited by the time there were beautiful papers by many people. Uh, as it happens, this is the 25 years of my very first foray into hippocampus. Um, so we made a simple theory, uh, inspired by a work of many people uh, mentioned here. Terry, of course, did pioneering work in that. Larry Abbott did pioneering work in that as well. 
Recently, Sandro Romani and Jeff McGee have been coming up with new findings in it. The key difference between those theories and the ones I made is that those theories are based on recurrent network largely focused on area CA3. Whereas I have focused on what happens in the feed forward network, the so-called perceptron. So each neuron gets input from a whole bunch of input neurons. And I won't go through the theory. It says if the rat went from left to right as a result of Hebbian plasticity, also known as spike timing dependent plasticity or STDP or an MDA dependent plasticity, the receptive field will shift backwards, will be able to predict the future. And that's how the animals can tell what's going to happen next based on the past experience of what happened next, given something happened now. So next slide is going to be very heavy. So if you're not a neuroscientist, just close your eyes and ears. I'm going to zip through to show you evidence and then I'm going to use it. So the claim is that place field plasticity is an emergent property of this Hebbian plasticity. Very quickly, place cell turn on abruptly within a few trials, even in a familiar environment. So it's not just a novel environment. The hippocampus seems to be learning things every day. They double their firing rate within a few minutes. Very robust, shown by lots of people. They acquire a ramping shape. The rat's going from left to right. The place will firing rate requires this ramping shape, very common in many parts of the brain, including dopaminergic system, but these guys develop it with experience. These are consistent with the models of either recurrent networks or a feed forward network that we generated Membrane potential of CA1 neurons, when they later on measure it, shows this ramping shape. Place cells, all these phenomena and more are blocked when you block an MD receptors, either systemic wide or just between CA3 and CA1. If you just block this Hebbian plasticity in that same feed forward network, these phenomena disappear. Uh, so that says that that does play a role. Uh, these mechanisms are actually enhanced. If you do something where you block edge current so that the STDP enhance, then these phenomena are actually enhanced. So that bi-directional control uh, and this memory trace is erased every night and the whole phenomenon repeats every next day. So this was known and I wrote up a whole paper uh, in 2014, given the success of this at the Nobel ceremony related article say mission accomplished. Uh, Place Hebbian plasticity causes place cell in a minor detail. Well, that's how spatially memory must work. But in all this, and all of us simply assume that there is something called place cell. And what the hell is a place cell? And how do they actually contribute to memory? The cells expand and shift and so on. But what does that have to do with behavior? So that was a harder problem. So I'm going to now play this video of John O'Keefe describing what a place cell is, so you can hear what he says, and you will understand what a place cell is. You don't hear the audio. Oh, you can't hear the audio. Hang on one sec. Let me stop sharing. Uh, I'm going to share again. And that time I'm going to turn on the audio. That was the mistake I made. All right, everybody sees this? Yes. Okay, so now you should be able to hear it. But which I'll say very little about because Anything. I'll leave it to the Moses to describe them in much, much greater detail. So let's go through and look at these cells in a bit more detail. So first there are the play cells. That's a rat. That's the arena, about one meter diameter where the rat runs. And you'll hear it in place an animal, this is a cartoon made by my colleague Julia Krupic. If we place an animal into a circular environment, we watch where it is using an overhead camera. Uh, and we also register where it is when one of these place cells fires. What we see is for, by and large, the cell is silent over most of the environment. And it's only when the animal goes into the part of the environment, which is preferred by that cell, its place field, that the cell fires. And so you can see all of these red dots are adding up. And it, what we typically use is a, 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 a heat map to represent the firing rate of the cells. So the heat map shows that this cell fires with a maximal firing rate of seven hertz here uh, and, and successively lower rates as you move away from, from the center. And this is a typical type of way in which we represent these cells. If we look, and one thing that I should point out is that if an animal runs around in an environment like this in an open field, it turns out that it doesn't make any difference which direction the, 
uh, animal runs through the place field. If it runs north, the cell is happy to fire. If it runs south, it's equally happy to fire. It looks as though the cell is representing the location and not something about the sensory uh, uh, impressions that the animal is get, getting in that in, in getting in that. So this is a crucial observation about what is a place cell and its properties. If there are any questions, ask me now. Otherwise, the whole talk will be kind of non-transparent. So any clarifications, simple questions. Otherwise, I keep moving forward. So now here is a very cool finding that has inspired many people, including me, to say, hey, there is this abstract representation versus all the neural responses to lights and sounds and so on. And that's pretty exciting because maybe that's where my brain creates this mathematics. Now there, the first question is, if the distal visual cues or the landmarks define where I am, how come the neurons don't care for what the rat is looking at? So in order to do that carefully, it turns out the neurons are a function of two variables, position and angle. So you can't just average things. So we had to develop slightly sophisticated method of separate estimation of firing rate as a function of the head direction and space, expand them in nice basis vectors, which are Zernike polynomials and cosines. And lo and behold, when we did that, we found actually that part is not true that majority of the cells here, there are spikes from one single place cell when the rat's running around. These spikes have a color based on the color wheel. You can see most of the spikes are red. This is the firing rate as a function of the rat's head direction. Most of the spikes are firing in this direction, but has this extra low, has multipole structure, but it's head direction. So, all right, that's a good news actually, that the visual cues, the where the rat is looking at to navigate does seem to play a role in direction, but that doesn't mean these are not abstract responses. That still means may, they may still be abstract, but it does depend on something. But then I thought, wait a minute, there are the two kinds of experiments people do. Classic experiments, any part of neocortex, a subject in this case of a cat or pupil and weasel sits in front of a screen. There's a particular orientation versus the O'Keefe's experiment, pioneering work, both of them where the rats running around. We don't know what he sees. We don't know what he smells. We don't know what he touches. In this case, people find these are concrete responses to specific stimuli. Here, it's an abstract representation. Exciting, but at the same time, we did two very different experiments to get two very different answers. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to convey the message that if we actually carefully measure exactly what the right is doing or seeing using virtual reality, we can bridge the gap between these two worlds uh, that are literally worlds apart. And I'm going to show you that not only we see place cells, but what is known already since 1980 is that blind rats are perfectly good place cells. How come blind rats are place cells? Maybe they're using olfaction, but then why won't sighted rats use olfaction? Consistently, when people rotated just the walls around the maze, just the visual cues, only 40% of cells change. When they rotated the floor, 60% of the cells rotated with it. So clearly those visual and olfactory cues seem to play a role. I'm gonna make a strong theoretical claim, just like in quantum mechanics actually, that if you knew with extreme precision where you are in space, that is not sufficient to navigate to a certain spot because you need on top of it, where the reward is in which direction and how far it is, which where my goal is. And the rats are doing it for a certain goal. In these experiments, there is no goal. The food is just falling randomly. So maybe that's why there is nothing. But spatial allocentric space is actually not necessary, not sufficient either, and may not even be necessary. If I simply know where the reward is, I don't need to know where I am. And in order to test spatial memory, what people have done is to the dunk the rat in a cold tank of water with a hidden platform. He runs around or swims around, doesn't know where the platform is, but as he figures out, then he goes there from many different directions after many trials and he makes a bee line, or in this case, a rat line to the hidden reward. And that's an evidence that he built a map based on many trials using visual landmarks. And the reason people use the water maze is because if they did the experiment on the dry maze, rat could be leaving scent marks as they do. So that's why it's a water maze. But along with that, there is another issue. Water maze is aversive. 
The rat is drowning in cold water. He's super uncomfortable. That's why he's running, running for his life. And that's an aversive task. Where that's a different kind of brain circuit, such as amygdala. Whereas place cell experiments are done when the rats are getting a reward. And it's not even clear to me that any animal will actually do path integration. Uh, I grew up in some poor neighborhood in India where we used to get rats and mice in our home. And if you try to catch them, they don't care the shortest part, they just get away in some random direction. So we need to measure place cell in a situation where rat has to calculate the shortest distance. He has the time and luxury to do that. So then the problem gets even more interesting and more surprising if you look at it. Here is a function, a classic experiment of hippocampal function showed that there is episodic memory deficit, such as conversation loss. Now we are focusing only on spatial memory. We are not asking what happened to episodic memory. Cellular basis, people found Hebbian plasticity, then LTP and LTD, theta burst plasticity, neurogenesis, STDP, more recently BTDP. Behaviorally, first they were placed cells and story was simple. Spatial memory, Hebbian plasticity, place cell, but then there were spatial view cells, grid cells, Jennifer Aniston cells, time cells, distance cells, olfactory and tactile cells. So a whole variety of cells have come out. So the story did not remain that simple. Hippocampus seems to be doing a whole bunch of things. If you now look at the space of theory, you have the theory of memory consolidation. It's not just what's happening in behavior. You have pattern separation, pattern completion. You have cognitive mapping, attractors, path integration, internally generated sequences that Buzaki has proposed, path integration by McNaughton, attractors by Hopfield and many others, cognitive map uh, by uh, O'Keefe and others, pattern separation by Marr. What I'm going to tell you is that all these phenomena here, except for the grid cell, we are still working on it, can be explained by a different hypothesis called multi-sensory association hypothesis that cannot be explained by these, but it still can ex be explained by this. STDP, spatial memory leads to all this stuff, and that can explain what this abstraction is or is not. And I'm going to show you that actually the same place cell, depending on the nature of experiment, can either represent space or distance or time or angle or certain more complex version just based on the way we are probing the system. And we are going to get into that. So let's get started with our experiment setup. So here is a big room that's a 60 dB sound insulation. It's a dead room, so rat cannot hear their footsteps. Uh, as shown in Feynman's book, rats can actually navigate by hearing their own footsteps. These are four walls, which have gigantic prominent colored cues. Rats don't see red, so most of the time we use only blue and green and black things. The stimuli are very clearly visible. He runs on a platform that's two meter diameter, had some randomish texture, either this or different. So he can't, and the texture is jarring, so he can't really localize himself too well based on some little things. It's on top of a ground, which is a grid kind of a pattern, like typical tiles, it's not as prominent but we want to emphasize every single thing rat can potentially see or hear. And if there's a neuron that's active, let's say here, that's the place field, then the cognitive map theory says it's because of a unique constellation of cues that the rat sees from here. When he's here, he sees this spiral versus this uh, flower. That's what tells him he's here. When he goes somewhere else, he sees distinct set of visual cues that creates a spatial map. But there are all these olfactory cues all over the place. Why won't the hippocampus use it, especially because hippocampus gets a major projection from the olfactory bulb? Why won't the rat's hippocampus and the rat use it? There are auditory cues, which two rats can use, given many of them are nocturnal, and that gives input to hippocampus too. There are vestibular cues that the rat can use, and the most important thing are proximal cues tiniest thing right under his nose, which is what the rat pays most, most attention to because that's where the food is, bits of chocolate. Why won't those tons of multi-sensory proximal cues too contribute to place cells and rat's behavior? So essentially what I'm going to show you is that what we have been looking at and calling place cells are not really place cells. They are different kinds of multi-sensory association. The nature of this multisensory association gives rise to different kinds of place cells. So how do we test these ideas? 
So first thing we did is we wanted to remove non-specific cues. So I was fortunate to have these very bright people work with us. Uh, all of them are doing amazingly well. And we developed a virtual reality for rats, which is different than most virtual reality. So we want to get started carefully about what that is. So first the rat is on a giant styrofoam ball. He's not a tiny ball that is falling off. So he feels it locally flat. This is all drawn to scale. And we had to work hard to make a giant ball float so that the mass is exactly 1.6 times the mass of the rat so that he doesn't feel it's too heavy. As he walks around, the ball moves. These microcontrollers pick up the movement, goes to a VR engine. It sends the signal to the speaker projector, sends the image to this pre-distorted mirror. We are in the astronomy department. They know how to do that. And the mirror is distorted so that the image goes all around the rat and the effective image around here is undistorted. So in this VR, unlike the most expensive VR goggles that you wear, where you can't see your hands or your feet, the rat sees himself 100%. He's the stimuli go over him. You will soon see he can see his own shadow. So the disembodiment is taken out. Second, there are no delays. Because the visual cues are all around. They don't depend on the rat's head acceleration. So when he moves his head, he sees exactly what he's supposed to see. So no delays, complete immersion in multi-sensory. Another important thing is that in this maze, the non-specific cues are uncorrelated with vision. That's a very important thing to keep in mind. On the ball, there are olfactory cues. There are tactile cues. There's a big giant projector making sound over his head. Those cues are present, but they do not tell the rat where the reward is. So those cues are not eliminated. The non-specific cues are not eliminated. They have been uncorrelated, unlike in the real world where everything is correlated. If there's a smooch on the ground, it's correlated with the visual cues unless somebody is rotating or doing something with the maze. Now we can do many trials because it's non-invasive. Rat can terminate the trial when he wants and we can do reliable electrophysiology. And the biggest advantage is that now we can test rats in humans or primates or any other species in the same condition. Unlike human beings, which are a meter plus from the ground who don't hardly see anything clearly on the ground or smell anything on the ground unless it's very strong versus rats, which are very close to ground. So we can test them with the same set of vision, which is the goal of testing things in rats to measure what might be going on in human brain. We need to test rats like humans. The other choice is we make humans walk on all fours or swim in a water tank when the patient has Alzheimer's not feasible. So let's now make some predictions. So here is this virtual reality maze. I'll show you the images of what the rat does. And now let's imagine that on this VR ball, there was some little schmutz that's represented by some random shape. Could be olfactory, tactile, auditory, something. Now as this rat starts to run, he reaches the same place once again after a little while, and the schmutz is now at a different place. Now what has happened in this case is that these random proximal cues, they are getting uncorrelated with visual cues. And we know that Hebbian plasticity is such that you need Hebbian plasticity associated. You need to have the same combination repeated many times. Here, one visual cue is uh, co correlated with one kind of olfactory cues. Here, the same visual cue is correlated with a different cue. Now we have two different hypotheses. Cognitive map theory says it's just visual cues and the, it's like somebody just cleaning up the floor. The place feels should be perfect in VR. The multisensory hypothesis is no. Actually, there should be no spatial selectivity because these things are getting uncorrelated. The map doesn't get established. And as I showed in the first part, the place cells change their firing rate within a few trials, supposedly due to heavy plasticity. And when the correlations are being broken up in different trials, as a result, there'll be long-term depression and the neural activity should go down. So two very bold predictions, diametrically opposite to this. And I should say that before we did this experiment, there are papers written by many major scientists, uh, uh, O'Keefe, uh, as well as others, who claim that place cells in VR are fine. I'm going to come back to that, why they claimed it's fine and why we say they are not fine in a minute. So now here is a rat that is running in VR. The camera is outside, so the scene looks distorted. But from the rat's point of view, it's undistorted. 
It looks like he's going somewhere. He's in one place. He's wearing a tuxedo that holds him. It lets him turn around a little bit like you're sitting in a chair, but you can't spin around unless you're that special rotating chair. And he has a little reward tube in front that gives him reward. And we suspend these little virtual pillars. And he's been taught to go underneath these virtual pillars with Hubel and Weasel's vertical stripes. If he goes underneath there, he gets a reward. Let's see what he does to see if he forms a map. So here he went under the pillar. He got a little tone to say, yes, you have reached. He got a reward. And while he's drinking the reward, the pillar teleported a different place. Watch his head. He looks at the pillar, looks, checks the reward, looks at the pillar. So we can do very accurate behavioral measurement. Got a reward. Now the next task is hard. The pillar is behind him. Watch what he does. So it clearly forms the upwards representation space. He notices the floor from the motion parallax. He's able to detect that he has reached the edge of the table purely based on motion parallax without vibrissal or olfactory cues. He gets the reward. And now I'll show you one more and then we'll keep going. These videos are on the lab's webpage so you can watch them. Once again, it's behind him. Watch, he's looking around for the reward indicating pillar. Runs there, sees the tip from the corner of the eye, runs away. So in this video can go on for quite some time. He can walk backwards, he can turn around, he stops, he takes a nap. In the early stages, he actually stands up and tries to touch the pillar with his snout, even though it's just out of curiosity. He hasn't even got a reward. So he, Rat is able to make a concept of 3D space in this virtual world, which is made purely by human. And I'll show you a lot more evidence that he does that. What do the place cells do? So first prediction, we now made a real world, which is just like the VR. Same room, same 60 dB insulation, same visual cues, but the proximal cues are doing all over the place. And on a tetrode, we can record many cells. This is just one tetrode, many cells in the real world when the rat walked around. This is the same tetrode in VR. And you can see straight off the bat, these cells, we are showing all the spikes, many of these cells shut down. And across the board, 60% of C1 neurons shut down in virtual reality compared to real world. That seems to fit extremely well with our simple Hebbian plasticity hypothesis, cannot be explained by uh, cognitive map theory. Let's verify the second prediction. What about the neuron, the 40% of neurons that were active? Here is the real world neuron. It's firing when the rat runs around. I'll be, I'll be using blue for real world, red for VR. That neuron is active in VR too, and notice it has no spatial selectivity left, hardly any. We quantify it, it's about 10 to 15%. So real world, there is selectivity. If the neuron is active in VR, selectivity is gone. Again, that fits with our theory, but doesn't fit with cognitive map theory. So let's look a little more carefully and notice that this activity is not entirely random. There are these long streaks of activity these long streaks here. Let's call it the hippocampal physiology string theory. So this thing starts to actually explain a hell of a lot. Let's get into that. Place cells, we don't see pretty much any spatial selectivity in hippocampus in VR. Unlike in the real world where 60% or more neurons show spatial selectivity. Is that something weird that we are doing? Our setup is busted. Well, you get to look into it in mice, less than 50% of cells are spatially selective. In bats, in the real world, these are all the numbers in the real world, it's 36%. In Daegu, a new paper came out, it's only 27%, another little uh, mouse-like feature. In primates, Edmund Rolls and many others did the experiment, but the primate walks around. In the real world, less than 5% are spatially selective. I would say it's because those other cues were not uh, contributing. How does it fit with other findings that people had made, claiming that place cells are actually present in all many species? Turns out even in human 2D navigation, it's only 10%, not 50 or 60%. So let's take a look at that and see if we can look into this so-called burst of activity and explain what's going on. So that's going to run in VR now, and you listen to the new so here's one neuron active. And notice the duration of activity is quite long. It's two seconds long. That's a long time scale for a neuron. 
time scale would be one millisecond or 100 millisecond of theta. Let me speed it up. So notice that whenever the neuron is active, it's active for a long period. And if we go back and look at the same neuron that's active in real world and in VR, if the neuron has a place field in the real world, in VR, of course, there's no selectivity. We look at how long is the neuron active, the duration, we forget about space. What we find is this remarkable thing, x-axis, the duration for which the neuron is active in the real world, inside the place field, of course, y-axis, the duration of activity in VR, pretty strongly correlated. And the duration varies anywhere from about one second to four seconds on the same tetrode. And they also show this interesting, very delicate phenomenon of phase precession, which the cognitive map theory said is due to interference between attractors, space and grid cell in phase precession are three sides of the same dice. This says, no, without any spatial selectivity, you get as good a phase precession as in the real world or slightly worse, but still significantly present. So that says that something else is going on. Uh, and it starts to support this idea. So then we got curious to say, well, maybe the theta rhythm itself has changed because that's crucial for inducing this plasticity. So we looked at individual cell here. Here is now the rat running around in the real world. And it shows clear theta rhythm. Green is the uh, local field potential. Blue is the theta band filter trace. This is the power spectrum. You see peak at theta in the so-called harmonic, which is something else. Here is the same electrode in virtual reality. Notice the magnitude of this whole thing went up. And on top of it, here's the theta band signal in blue that's still present, but we filtered in a new band, which is pretty evident from here. That's called eta band, about less than half of theta, not exactly. And we call it eta because eta is half of theta and in Greek, eta means half. So couldn't escape the pun, gigantic signal right here. And here is the power spectrum. This is the entire data when he's running and you see theta and even the third harmonic of eta where there should be nothing based on theta right there. This is three times eta as the theta I can give you. So all of a sudden something else happened that in virtual reality, not only there is phase precession, but theta rhythmicity became stronger and theta rhythm developed, the brain developed a new kind of rhythm that's four hertz. Lo and behold, that's the frequency of theta rhythm in humans and non-human primates. It's four hertz, not eight hertz. So that seems to work out quite well too. Seemingly, the nature of multisensory experience not only determines how many neurons are active, but the nature of selectivity, but also seems to determine hippocampal rhythmicity. Now this got a very excited. We have filed for a patent that maybe we can use VR for learning and memory, for training, because we can boost theta rhythm. Boosting theta rhythm is a major pharma pharmacological target for all kinds of diseases from Alzheimer's to anything else. Any drug, cholinergic drugs that boost theta, the effect is about 10 to 20%. Here it's about 80% boosting of theta, totally non-invasive strongly within the CA1 that I won't show you. So VR starts to pay off some dividends. It can be potentially used for treatment of disorders, but can it be used for diagnosis too? So now let me test one more thing. Notice that one second long period that we show. If it is the case that when you have multiple cues are consistent, you should get representation then I should be able to get you back place cells in virtual reality by simply introducing correlation between two different modalities. The two major modalities people have stated are quite crucial in rat hippocampal function are A, locomotion cues for path integration, B, vision. In random foraging, vision and locomotion are uncorrelated. We are simply going to introduce correlation between vision and locomotion. So that's going to run in virtual reality. Let's see what the neuron does. Again, cognitive map says it should be as good as two dimension or one dimension should make no difference. Multisensory cues says you should get a strong representation in this case, but of a different kind. So let's see. So he's running in VR now. Uh, that's a, again, two second long motif. He gets a reward there, we cut out that data. 
is another two second long motif, so seemingly random. Is a third two second long motif. And all we did is make the rat walk with the same reward indicating pillar, but on a systematic path. So whenever he's at this location, he just got the reward. The visual cues, are, he starts to accelerate. The visual cues come looming towards him and the reward is farther away. All three things are consistent. As a result, you got the representation equally at all the three points. So you did not get actually place cells, you actually got distance cells. And I won't share you the data with me, this is all in papers. All the cells in virtual reality encode distance travel with respect to these three things. Which of these three things are making a difference? We are going to come to that and we are going to break it apart and to see what that is. So neurons actually are encoding when you combine two modalities in consistency between them. They are always present, locomotion is present, vision is present in these experiments. All that we did is made them consistent, unlike random foraging, the neurons start to encode egocentric distance, how much have I traveled, but rather than absolute allocentric position, just one spot, they didn't do that. So now we are super thrilled with the same neuron in the real world where everything is consistent, you get so-called allocentric place cell. If nothing is consistent, pure vision, you only get time. And if one thing gets consistent, the neuron starts to represent position. But notice this neuron is active in only one side, not on all three arms. This is what the experiments were done by David Tank and John O'Keefe. The rat was simply running in single direction from one end to the other. Then he was getting teleported. Then he ran from beginning to end teleported. Of course, if you looked only in one direction, it'll look like beautiful place cell. They did not look at this, so that's why there was a minor disagreement, but I think we are all consistent here. And the best part is, based on the nature of correlation, either we encode allocentric space or time or distance. So going back to this, this is the finding in the two-dimensional random foraging. If you go in one dimension, 70% of cells in rats, mice, bats, primates, humans, and in 1D, we are actually spatially selective. So this is consistent with our theory and many other people's work. In fact, 70% in rats and mice of cells show place selectivity even without any visual cues. Buzaki and Jeff McGee have been doing experiments where what they do is they just put the rat on a conveyor belt and on the conveyor belt, they put some tactile cues. There are no visual cues. And the neurons fire reliably at the location of those tactile cues because those inputs do reach. So this simple, lots of data fits this idea. Not only that, in virtual reality, direction selectivity is intact. Here is a cell that's in VR, as happens to be active. These are the spikes, no spatial selectivity, but direction selectivity is pretty strongly present in VR too, exactly the same as real world. So that's not an artifact of something else. So we come to conclusions and then I'll take questions here. So visual and locomotion cues actually are not sufficient to generate robust spatial selectivity in hippocampus. It's a major departure from a standard belief that just vision and locomotion is enough to give you place cell. This says no. On the other hand, they say that vision and locomotion alone actually are sufficient to not only generate direction selectivity, but also control it suggesting that these responses are not abstract responses. They are responses evoked by specific visual cue. And the nature of sensory motor correlation determines the nature of responses. If olfactory cues are consistent with vision, you get place cell, otherwise you get time or distance. So let me pause here before I go to the latest stuff. Any questions so far? And if you just stop here, that's fine too. Uh, so, so Mank, you mentioned you mentioned the uh, vestibular uh, input. Now that's something that I guess the the rat isn't getting if it's always that's right the ball. So there may be a disconnect there between. That's right, absolutely. So uh, hang on one sec. I don't know what happened. Why did it stop sharing? Uh, let's share once again. Uh, yeah. That's right. So perfect question. Here, let me share a slide, which I had just prepared before this. Assuming you'll ask the question, I didn't. 
So David Tank actually built, oops, sorry. Uh, David Tank actually built a new kind of VR. Now, this is the only time this VR has been used. So here is the room with the door and so on. Inside there is a VR and the rat is on a ball. Now, the funny, the interesting thing, the unique thing about this VR is that it allows full set of vestibular cues, meaning that the VR cues are fixed. Here is certain visual cue here, and the walls are here. And when the rat turns, unlike in our VR, when the rat turns, he keeps facing the same way the visual cues that turn. In his case, the rat himself turns around. So that way he gets full set of vestibular cues. But along with that, one more thing has happened. What has happened is that when the rat turns in VR, he's turning not only with respect to the visual cues in VR, but he's also turning with respect to the projector over his head. He's turning with respect to the proximal cues on the floor around the ball and the cues outside, such as the room. When the rat turns, he's turning with respect to the door. He's turning with respect to the rack. So they did that experiment where what they did is they took the rat outside the thing and they simply rotated the visual cue here. It's still a cylinder, so nothing is rotated. Just they rotated the visual cue. And what they found is that this is the cell number one, for example, on a given day, they brought the rat back after 24 hours. They simply rotated the visual cue. If this was entirely due to visual cues in the VR, he couldn't see outside. The cell should be firing the same location. That cell actually rotated with the VR. Same thing with this cell. It was firing at this angle in the VR frame. When they rotated, instead of firing here, it fired here. This cell as well, it was firing here in the VR frame. Uh, with respect to here now, with respect to the VR frame, it shifted, whereas in the room frame of reference, it's the same. So when you include the multi-sensory cues, you make them consistent. Vestibular cues are one of them, but also other cues. Not only you get back place cell, but place cells are actually anchored to the cues outside the maze. The rat cannot even see. So that actually starts to fit. And that's why we did this experiment of the direction selectivity, which is that if it was the lack of direct lack of vestibular cues that was causing the place cell decrement, then I should get no, no direction selectivity in VR. But the direction selectivity is as good in VR as in the real world. No statistically significant difference. So I think that's the reason I'm giving that explanation. But let me pause here and take more questions if need be. Okay, so uh, it, it, unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Sorry? I'm, uh, I'm saying that if any of the audience wants to ask a question, go ahead sure. and unmute yourself. I guess not. Okay, well, we can. Okay, so let me go to the rest of it is pretty easy. I'm just going to show you that the rat can actually do virtual Morris Ward maze tasks. So he's going, there's now no reward indicating pillar. Uh, this paper was published in 2017, and the answer to that question is no. Why that answer is no, it's a long story. I'll just tweak your curiosity to go there. He's left facing the wall. He's to go to an unmarked location to get a reward. Can you do that? The answer is yes. So there are all kinds of cues that are available. He does that. Notice he turns around and he'll go there. Uh, now there's nothing to tell him where the reward is. It's an unmarked location on two meter platform. He gets stressed out. He doesn't know where the reward is. He'll, he'll bumble around and here is the statistics of the summary. These are the four different start points. Here's the unmarked location, which once he reaches there, we'll give him a feedback. These are four different start points from which he goes. And you can see that the neuron, this rat goes very reliably to this location. The parts are very different from four start points. Now he, you can tell that he got figured out where it is, he starts to go. And because he gets a little reward, the flashback and the reward saying you reached, and then he gets teleported to a different start point and so on and it begins. So he's clearly doing the task very well. Let's look at now the neural responses in this task. Can the rats navigate? Can they do this path integration task or cognitive mapping, depending on whom you ask, with, the, with only vision, not even vestibular cues? The answer is yes, he can. We have quantified that. He learns as fast as the real water maze, even though this is appetitive. Here is one neuron. There is no real selectivity. You look at the firing rate. It's not very impressive. 
And as I told you, even if we had found place cell, you won't get anything out of it. So what's going on? So we got interested to say the way to do this will be that the neuron has to actually represent three things. Not only where he is, maybe that's optional, but where is the reward location? How far is it and in which direction? He is to keep track of that at every place. And lo and behold, if you look, so we have to use generalized linear model to decode these three things at the same time. Here is one neuron, there's four different start points, the colors represent the distance traveled by the rat. Notice the neuron fires at all the four starting points here shown is the function of distance alone at the same distance, about 20 centimeters. So this neuron encodes distance travel regardless of starting point. Here is another neuron, again, distance travel regardless of the allocentric starting point. This neuron encodes about 70 centimeters and then has a little bump, that's another story. And if you stack all the cells that are distance coding, most of the distance coding cells are clustered right at the beginning. And then they cover all the way up to 250 centimeters. Here are the two different neurons. Here the colors are actually the right head direction with respect to the hidden reward zone. These neurons are coding direction. Notice the reward zone is in this angle. This neuron is more or less in that direction. So is this neuron and across the population of neurons, this is how many neurons prefer which direction most of the neurons point directly towards that hidden reward zone without any stimulus there. Very strong bias towards the hidden reward zone. And here is the remaining neurons that encode spatial selectivity. They encode the proximity of the reward. This neuron is active right next to the reward and the ensemble of neurons encode the position of the reward, position of the hidden reward zone. And it turns out these are not three different class of neurons the same neuron actually encodes all the three things. So majority of the neurons encode distance, next major is direction with respect to reward and a small fraction of the location of reward. The same neuron starts to represent distance, then switches over to direction and then switches over to the location of the reward. So it switches very quickly. These reward, this, these representations are highly behavior dependent. This is the day on which the behavior is good. You can see he's going straight to it. The lines are straight. He, this is the day on which the performance is bad. Neural representations of all three things are very sharp on the day on which performance is good. They are quite poor on the days on which the performance is poor. Look at this distance tuning here versus this crummy tuning, direction tuning very sharp here and here versus crummy. This across all the data, X axis is right performance, how quickly he got reward, Y axis, how many cells were tuned, very strong tuning between neural selectivity on all four measures versus performance. Is this plastic? Is this consistent with this theory of us and many other people? Turns out that rat's behavior improves within a single session. In the first 30 trials, the performance is not as good even in a highly familiar environment. This is the only thing it does. In the next 30 trial, the performance is better. It improves very systematically. If you look at the neural distance coding, distance coded move backwards. Here is the uh, trial number. Here's the episodic distance. We call it an episode because beginning to end is an episode. The neural, neural uh, accumulation of distance coding was clustered at around 150. It started to move back by about 30 centimeters down to 100. And the behavior change after the neural changes happened. First the neural change in green, then the behavioral change. Similarly, the amount of clustering, the, as was shown by Sodix and Sinoski's paper, that if you have heavy and plasticity, neural receptive fields will cluster. The clustering happens first and increases first and then the behavior changes. Exactly the same thing happens with respect to the directional tuning. The directional tuning improves first and then the rat's behavior improves. Direction tuning clustering increases first and then the directional behavior changes suggesting there is some causal relation. So I'm going to stop this as well, and I'm going to finish up with one finding. Any questions for this so far? I'm just rushing through, but happy to answer questions before I show you one last thing. Okay, so let me then ask one more question. When we are looking at episodic coding in humans, such as patient HM, when you have a question or a conversation, 
Nobody's going anywhere. The HM is not walking around. Can hippocampal activation require neurons be activated when the rat's going nowhere? There's no reward. There is no task. He just sits there and some stuff happens in the world, such as what's happening right now to you. So again, let's come to this simple theory. Cognitive map says, or path integration says, there is no response. And that's what many people have concluded. People have tried to play auditory and visual cues. Allen brain people use flashing stimuli, Gabor patches, no response. But the multi-sensory hypothesis says, if all the modalities are clamped, then you should get a small, very strong activation. But we had to design the experiment carefully. Hippocampus is further down the periphery. The receptive fields there in hippocampus, if they are, are likely to be very big. So we did this little thing. We put the rat in the same apparatus. There's a big cylinder and we decouple all his movement. So if he wants, he can run so he can feel comfortable. They quit and they sit there. And without him doing anything, a bar of light simply moves around him once in 10 seconds. It just keeps moving continuously, regardless of what he does. Do the neurons code for this? So here is the rat sitting there. This is drawn to scale, big bar of light covering his visual field rotating. The areas behind the rat, he cannot see. The areas around him, he can see quite well. This he can barely see. Here is a neuron. Zero degrees is in front. Plus minus 180 is behind. This neuron fires very reliably when he's looking straight up front in a counterclockwise rotation. This neuron fires at minus 20 degrees. This at plus 90 degrees almost to the side. Here is a clockwise rotation. This neuron is firing when the bar of light is to his left. This neuron is firing again to his left, and this neuron when the bar of light is behind him, which he cannot see. So he's calculating something, but it is a sensory response. Then we got more excited. This is both this angle and direction. What if we just want to look at distance? So he simply took a bar of light, either it approaches the rat or it recedes. Again, very slowly, there is no behavior, no task, no reward. He just sits there, it's not even virtual reality. Neurons encode all the distances and angles. Simultaneously responded, uh, recorded neurons encode distance, direction, and angle. We can, based on this, calculate from the moment the stimulus reached the retina, how long did it take for the neurons to generate a response? Very reliably, around 274 plus minus 10 milliseconds. So for the first time, we know this stimulus evoked the response of so the latency is 274 millisecond, fits with beautifully with our work and in human data. Just like cortical areas show cortical magnification, four-wheel regions are more represented than the temporal region. We see very similar uh, magnification. These responses depend on the color of the stimulus. If you change the color, the neural responses change substantially. If you change color or the pattern response to change, if you change color and pattern, the response to change even more between the two things. If you change the predictability of neural response, instead of moving very smoothly, they move slightly randomly, the selectivity goes down. And if you wait it for 24 hours, the selectivity is gone. So there's a lot of discussion these days about representational drift. And the claims has been that representational drift happens because rat's behavior is different on different days. Here in hippocampus, there is a massive representation of one stimulus. There is no behavior, and you see massive representational drift within 24 hours, more so than the very determinable factors. And this follows from Hebbian plasticity result that I told you. In hippocampus, Hebbian plasticity is very fast, happens within five trials. And there is even a bias. Approaching stimuli give you greater selectivity than receding stimuli. So I have finished my time. I want to show you very quickly where this happens. I want to advertise where this might be happening, where the time period comes in. And that comes in in the dendrite. So these neurons have all kinds of shapes. Everything we have told you is in the cell body. We played with the idea that we can make chopstick electrodes, tetrodes with a little gap that can trap a dendrite. And once the tetrode is trapped between the dendrite, it'll still not give you a, a membrane potential. But every electrode that you put in brain-machine interface gets attacked by glial cells. That's the immune system of the brain to sort some extent. The immune cells, when they cover it up, they have fatty membrane. So even though the impedance between the electrode and dendrite is high, that impedance is much smaller 
than the electrode in the ground because in between are these huge fatty layers of astrocytes. So you create a voltage divider circuit which stabilizes it. Can we measure the signal? We can. So here is one single dendritic signal measured in freely behaving animal. Uh, you can hear the sound. It's unlike spikes. It's very strong bass. Uh, ordinary computers won't even do good justice to hearing the sound. I'm going to show you very quickly and notice gigantic subthreshold fluctuations. Somatic subthreshold fluctuations are 10 millivolts, spikes 100 millivolts. Here, the subthreshold fluctuations are bigger than this for every cell. We quantified that. Here is one single dendritic spike. Notice it's 10 millisecond long, not somatic spike, which is one millisecond. Here is confidence interval across 26 hours of recording, highly stable recording. We can measure exactly when it started. They look exactly like dendritic sodium spikes. And the number of dendritic sodium spikes, are. these are all 24 of the dendritic spikes we recorded. Here are simultaneously 1600 extracellular spikes. This on log scale. A branch of dendrite is generating 10 times as many spikes as the soma. And if you looked in the subthreshold, this is where there is a long time scale. This subthreshold potential in freely behaving rat is generating gigantic duration depolarizations lasting several seconds. We believe that's where this time period comes from. So let me not go into sleep and all that stuff and our theory of persistent activity and how this arises in the brain, but let me end up. So hippocamp is a hierarchical multisensory association circuit according to us. Uh, nature of association gives you this, depending on what you do, if everything is consistent, it looks like allocentric space because the stimuli are in allocentric space. The olfactory cues are in register with visual cues, or you get distance or time or angle simultaneously, or all of them at the same time, or if you take it out, we just get this one thing. So when I started with this, I showed you this complicated thing. Based on what I have suggested to you, we have addressed something about spatial memory. We are related to STDP. It seems to be related to so-called place cell, but they also become spatial view cell, face cells, time cells, distance cells, and olfactory things. Smaller dots mean we need more evidence. There is some evidence for distance coding as well, because the rats are, the neurons are representing distance, and there is a reasonable evidence of hierarchical multisensory association. And on top of it, we found a new rhythm, which is entirely based on the nature of experience. So I stop here, and I'm sorry I overran by a minute. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. That that really covered a lot of ground. Uh, so, uh, Pascal, you have your hand up. Why don't you uh, unmute yourself? I'm just clapping and thanking Mayak for a great, great talk. Oh, okay, okay, very good. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I have, uh, you know, the, one of your experiments uh, reminded me of some human experiments. Uh, you know, yeah. so when you were moving the pillar back and forth. Yeah. Very slowly. Right. Yeah. Over many seconds. Yeah. Um, so it, in humans, it looks as if uh, rather than you said, and I, 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 I know, I, you know, temp, only 10% of the cells are place cells. Okay. Well, what are yeah. the rest of them? It turns out that a lot of them are saccad cells. That yeah. Tell you where you're looking. That's right. Not, not where you are, but what you're looking at. And so that's fantastic. That, I love that reference, actually, because we didn't know this, but. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll definitely. Yeah. I'll, I would love to cite this. Yeah. Like I, I'll write to you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the problem is that the hippocampus, by the way, you know, you show the Venison diagram and uh, the HC, right? You, you, you interpret it as the hippocampus. There's some people who interpret that as the homunculus. Yeah. <laughs> Which is probably. Which, which uh, that is to say, the uh, part of the brain that keeps track of, of you. So yeah. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, most of those recordings, I think you did and others were in the dorsal part of the hippocampus, right? Yes, absolutely. So what's happening, and that means, you know, yeah. the, 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 in the rat, it curves around and then it goes That's down. That's right. The ventral part is the, of the part that nobody yeah. reports from, or very few. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and the question is, uh, we know the grid cells get bigger there. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and it looks as if it, it has different inputs and outputs. And so what do you yeah. think the ventral hippocampus is up to? Is it, is it similar in terms of the function? Yeah, we, first of all, we haven't looked. There was one or two papers from Moser and others which claim that ventral hippocampus has bigger place feeds. So that is there. So what we are trying to do now is to actually not just look at place cells, but look at more general representations. So all the responses that I showed you, the first part, place responses were in navigation task. So our focus now is to leverage the time business, the fact that there is this period of time that's conserved across three different experiments, systematic pillar, random pillar, or place cell, same time is conserved. So we are actually chasing after that period of time and seeing if it plays a role in learning, non-spatial learn. So we are building new tasks in which we can ask the rat to do the time kind of calculation. And there, I think that the ventral hippocampus will take care of longer time periods and the dorsal will take care of short time periods. And that, you know, I, I won't be nasty to you, but the paper that I just flashed on the screen very briefly, in, which is on bioarchive, that shows how these different time scales can arise. So we are trying to test it. And the other place we are going is entorhino, because that's one major source of input. We already wrote one paper showing that entorhinal layer three neurons, exactly the ones that project to layer uh, to CA1, they even in anesthetized animals show these two to three second long periods, anesthetized animals. So we believe that's where the magic may begin, but you know, don't know. That's a short answer to your question. Okay, okay. So uh, does anyone else have a question that they would like to ask? Uh, let's see, where is... Well, so far everybody's muted. Okay, well, I guess I could go on. Okay, so uh, go, could you replay the, uh, you know, the, the John O'Keefe clip where he shows the rat place cell forming? And, yeah. and I, I want to point something out, which I noticed, uh, but I uh, it was not until uh, I heard your, saw your data. For the I think cell. that you, you and I might be, is it that you notice that that cell is highly directional? Yeah, well, it's no, it's, it's you get a sequence of spikes, like along a yes, straight line. Yes, absolutely. Okay, yep. Which is a directionality, the form of directionality. That's but, right. So, yeah, it's right. So you see the motif there as well. And those are directional. We actually downloaded the video and we calculated in our lab that they, that cell is highly directional. So take a look right there. All right. So let's turn this on which I'll say very little about because I'll leave it to the Moses. It was about halfway through, I think. Yeah, it's right here. If we place an animal, this is a cartoon made by my colleague, Julia Kukic. If we place an animal into a circular environment- It's just facing this way. We watch where it is. This way. Using an overhead camera. Uh, and we also register where it is when one of these place cells fires. What we see is for, by and large, the cell is silent over most of the environment. And it's only when the animal goes into the part of the environment, which is preferred Again, by that cell, it's is it these two directions it prefers? the cell fires. And so you can see all of these red dots are adding up. And it, what we typically really use striking. is a, no. a, a, yeah. a, a, a heat map to represent Not at all. the fire yeah. rate of the cells. So the heat map. OK, we do, have a, we do have a question. OK, so I, I, I think it's interesting that you know people do not see things in their own data. <laughs> yeah, know, even Nobel Prize winners, uh, but that's okay because it's that's good. right. Yeah, he left something for us to work on. Yeah, that's right. That's okay. right. I mean, he made an amazing discovery without which I would not be doing any of yeah, this. Yeah, so. and, and uh, you know, obviously, we, we you know we always uh, uh, you know when you have better tools and techniques, things get yeah. uh, you know you can measure things yeah. better. Yeah. Uh, okay, so a uh, Homero. I think this is Homero has a, a chat question. Does the multi-sensory theory have any oh, yeah. or explanation specific for uh, SWR? Is the All right. So I'm going to be nasty to you. And one slide that I quickly rushed over, I'm just going to point to you just that much. Oh, so the replay. Yeah. Yeah, replay. So based on these findings, this is before the, the, the what do you call the virtual reality thing, we made a little theory of the sharp wave ripple sharp replay. Wave so ripples, look, right? Yeah, sharp wave ripple replay very quickly. So here is the classic finding. So the rat is sleeping in the before experience. 
there is some pattern of spiking in the uh, in the sharp wave ripple, but it's debatable, but it doesn't seem to be related to the next behavior. Then there are trends on the track, cells fire in a certain sequence on a long time scale. Notice this one second. And when he goes to sleep once again, the cells quite often reproduce the same sequence, but much faster. So behavioral sequence is one second long. The replay takes only like 50 milliseconds. So that's the classic finding. That's called replay. So it brings a couple of questions. What generates this replay? And why is the replay so fast? Why is it 50 times faster? It brings in a couple of other questions too. Other question is, which is not advertised heavily, but is well established in every paper. If you dig into the method section, this replay happens as strongly after a familiar environment versus highly novel, very novel environment. The writer does for the first time the experience, the replay happens. If he does the same experience 50 times, I have done this and many people have shown, as soon as he finishes the experiment, the replay is seen for about 5% of spikes. And then in about half an hour, the replay decays to chance level. Now that is different in CA3 versus CA1, but I'm going to come to that later. Similarly, place field plasticity, Stefan Lloyd Gabe and uh, Jim Kneerim and other labs have shown there are differences in CA3 and CA1, but let me stick only to CA1 for now. So replay happens every day. It's only 5% and then it decays to chance level within half an hour. So before I tell you what should happen in virtual reality, I want to cover these four classic observations. A, replay happens equally after a familiar and novel environments. B, it is 50 times faster. C, it's only 5% and D, it decays within half an hour close to chance level. If I can explain these four things, then I can tell you what happens in VR. So here's a simple theory, right? Here are hippocampal neurons. We are focusing on these colored neurons that are later on going to be active in the maze. As we remember, the number of neurons active in the maze, even in the real world, are at most 50%. 50% of cells are shutting down. So these are the gray neurons. And there's some network. This network is somewhere in the hippocampal system. Maybe CA3, CA1, dentate, I don't know, some network somewhere. And it gets this neocortical synchronous input during up and down states where all cortical neurons become synchronously active, they drive these neurons. There, let's say that I had no knowledge, we ignore for the time being beautiful work of George Dragoi said and Tonegawa saying there's some preplay, but let's say I don't go into that too much, let's say it's very weak, which is for sure. The recent behavioral task replay, even after a familiar environment experience next day before the experiment after 24 hours is very weak, so let me ignore it. Now we start to run in the maze, and as a result, the connections of the neurons that were activated sequentially get stronger. Our work suggests quite strongly that's the case, and that's due to sequential experiential thing in the behavior. So the neurons are activated in the sequence, and now you have the sequential memory encoded, the memory trace in the network. And the, the gray neurons, they just sit there, they don't do anything because they did nothing. Now the rat goes to sleep. And the neocortical synchronous up and down state activity comes in. Let's imagine purely by chance this green neuron was activated. As soon as the green neuron is activated, we now have to think of two kinds of networks. A, the hippocampus is a strongly coupled network so that when the green neuron is activated, the orange and then the purple will be activated 90% of the time. In that case, the strongly coupled network, the replay, will be 100% or 90% of the time. That means the replay should get stronger and hence the recent memory trace in hippocampus should also get stronger because it already got stronger here. And then during sleep, this replay goes in the same sequence becomes even stronger. Other possibility is that these connections, this network is strongly coupled to the external inputs and the internal connections are weak. In that case, as soon as this neuron is activated, the next neuron will be activated only 5% of the time. That means the replay will be very rare. As a result of the replay being rare, these connections which were strengthened systematically, now 95, 55% of the time they replay the behavior sequence, 45% of the time they do the random thing, that starts to weaken this memory trace. That's why the memory state starts to go away and that's why it's replayed every single day. So in virtual reality, we should see the same thing. 
because I already showed you that the representation is going away overnight. The next day, the place cells, the so-called visually active vectorial cells that we discovered, unlike place cells that depending on, there's a lot of debate from various labs, some say it decays over seven days or not, but these actually go away. So I believe if this turns out that this decay of the memory, memory trace in virtual reality should be even faster because more neurons have shut down and the correlations are even weaker. So we'll see if that turns out or not. We are trying to put you know, some mathematical teeth behind these words. And that's one of the papers that's online. It's more complicated than this, but that's a short answer, or rather a very long answer. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, you know, the, it's believed that the, uh, the input to CA1 is coming from the, the sharp wave ripples in CA3. Yes. And you're but saying- that story has become a little tricky because it used to be believed that sharp wave ripples come from CA3, but then there's a little supplement in a Tonegawa paper where they silence CA3. And they found pretty decent amount of sharp ripples without CA3 being active at all. So now the theory of where the sharp ripples come in is become a little more nuanced. But I don't think that paper supports the idea that sharp waves come entirely from CA3. Okay, okay. So yeah. There there's another uh, observation. You know, Eric Holgren has uh, evidence that in humans with ECOG, yeah. that there are really strong uh, ripples in the cortex. Yeah, and, that's right. That's right. And, and presumably there is an input, you know, from the, from the enterorhinal directly to CA1. So that- That's right. Us. Yeah. And in fact, that's right. And we actually, in the another paper, which I'm not showing here, in 2012 paper, we simultaneously measured the membrane potential of layer three neurons in entorhinal cortex and C1 neurons activity. And whenever the medial entorhinal cortical layer three activity was higher, that's when C1 was more active. And I may even have a slide that shows that here. Hopefully I still, I included that, probably not. Uh, no, I didn't include that, but it's a 2012 Nature Neuroscience paper where we showed this. Um, that there is, I mean, that showed a little bit here, but never mind. Let me not go through too many slides. But yes, that definitely happens. And specifically, when layer three of medial internal cortex is more active, but layer three of lateral internal cortex is not active, that specific combination is when C1 neurons are most active. So it's an XOR kind of a thing. Uh, that's Han et al. 2012, Nature Neuro. Right. Good. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I think we should thank you once again for thank uh, you. a very stimulating lecture, lots of data, a lot of food for thought. And uh, and I think it's still evolving. You know, in, in other words, I think that uh, I don't think we're there yet. I think we still have there's some mysteries. Yes. And um, and I think that uh, actually some of the you know, uh, one of my graduate students has developed some models of the, the uh, loop from the internal cortex uh, oh, yeah. to CA1 and then indirectly through the CA3 and then directly through the, uh, you know, uh, internal cortex lower layers, I think it's layer three. We'd love so, to hear about it and yeah, maybe so, there's something we can do, yeah. No, no, so the, no, I'll just get, give you the punchline. The punchline is that uh, it, what it's doing is, is predicting. Uh, the, oh. The campus learns to predict what's the next thing that's going to come in from the cortex because of the delay line yeah. through, the, through the CA3, through the indirect pathway. But that's another story. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. So thanks again. And very thanks much. Thanks everyone. Appreciate uh, all yep. your, your uh, uh, insights here. Very good. Yep. Okay. Thanks Thank again. Thank you and enjoy. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Right. Bye everybody.